Um, one of the things that um, they don't tell you in Vicar College, um, either when you're there as a student or as a teacher, is that parishes can be places of immense intellectual stimulation as well as all of the pastoral and spiritual care. And one of the, um, the brilliant things about this parish, when I came, because I've only been in post for about two years, which would, um, and 19 months of that has been a pandemic, uh, one of the things that, they, uh, that I noticed about this parish, of course, was the beautiful wall paintings. Um, I'd be lying if I said that didn't make the decision to come here easier. Um, but what they didn't tell me was that the wall paintings would be one of those occasions where we could have some proper intellectual stimulation. Um, and of course that's important in a parish. The assumption is that parishes are places that are slowly dying and why I think events like this are important is because buildings like this testify to the witness of a community across not just generations but across centuries and they also witness and they bear in their bodies the scars of where they've been. Um, I, I was really interested to read in the programme in Bob's um, wonderful um, timeline that they were astonishingly prompt at liming the walls when the prayer book came in. Isn't that interesting? Um, that the building bears within itself all of these historical changes and it's for that reason that I was particularly excited when Bob said, I'd like to do a symposium. I said, brilliant, brilliant. Do I have to do anything? <laughs> and, and he said, no, you've just got to come and welcome everybody. And so, um, so, so firstly, welcome to you, our delegates. Um, you're, you're very warmly welcome here. Uh, do take the time to have a proper look around the place. Um, secondly, welcome and thank you to um, all of you who are presenting. Um, this will be um, amazingly stimulating for all of us who attend. Um, we're, we're glad for your expertise and we're also glad for your time. Um, and thirdly, thank you to all those legion of uh, supporters who have um, assisted with setting up moving pews. Fortunately, the pews are movable. Um, providing tea and coffee, sorting out audio visual, um, dealing with many technical problems, printing. Um, we couldn't have organised this without you, so, so I'm very grateful to, uh, to all of you, and particularly to Bob and to the friends. Um, other than that, I don't have anything to say besides, um, I hope this is a really good day. Thank you, Michael. Um, so, our, our first speaker today is uh, Madeline Katkoff. Welcome, Madeline. Fantastic to see you here. And uh, take it away. The house is all yours. Uh, it's, I'm not really speaking, I'm just doing another welcome um, from the, um, those of us who gathered this all together. Um, it's actually taken five years to get you here. Uh, Bob and I did talk about uh, the need for an event like this when I was working on the wall paintings in um, the winter of 1516. Um, because it's, uh, if, um, if you're working on a wall painting you, uh, and are there for long hours day to day, you get a, a sort of intimacy with them. Um, that's to do with 
uh, closely observing how the original painter would have set about it. So you realize sometimes that you're in the same position as presumably he would have been when he was painting that little bit. You notice when he's been sloppy or when he's been particularly attentive to detail. Uh, and so you come away wanting a much better idea of the context that the paintings were um, produced in and basically needing more information. And um, Bob also was very keen to have, to, to gather expertise from uh, different fields to put their input. He states that in his preface to the second edition of the guidebook, and he also says, I might not agree with them. So for the rest of the speakers, beware. Um, and so eventually, uh, here you all are, and we've got lots of people from lots of speakers with, with a different take on the paintings. So I hope you all have a satisfactory day. Um, there's just one little uh, um, a bit about the organization for the day. You've had information about asking questions. We've got a sort of two-tier system so that Reader, uh, speakers will uh, will allow five or ten minutes after the speaker has spoken, and that's really just for clarifications and a bit of input and things you haven't heard or or didn't understand. And anything that needs discussing should come at, in the discussion time at, at in the afternoon. And if you couldn't write your questions on the little slip you've got in your folders, it would be very helpful. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that there are two parishioners who aren't with us today who would have absolutely loved to be here. Um, one was a thinker and one was a doer, and they're uh, Paul Jakes and Mick Lomas, so um, we're sorry not to have them. Thank you, Madeline. This is the technology. <laughs> Chalgrove, the church, and the crown. As well as a constant supply of clean drinking water from its many springs, Chalgrove had a rich pasture land, good meadow land, very productive arable land, and a widely fed brook that provided a reliable source of power for processing homegrown products and those from neighboring areas. What better place to live in? So it's not surprising, therefore, that much evidence of life in Chalgrove during the Bronze Age the Iron Age, Roman and Saxon eras have been found within and all around the village. In circa 1890, when Alfred the Great created the Burr of Wallingford, he included Chalgrove in the network of local manors that provided food and manpower to defend the Burr. Doomsday Book, 1086, describes Chalgrove as a thriving, well-established, valuable piece of real estate. Land for 12 ploughs, six mills at 60 shillings, meadow three furlongs long and three furlongs wide, pasture 60 acres, the value was 10 pounds, now 12 pounds. The nine slaves, 23 villagers and 10 smallholders noted would have been the heads of the households, the Victoria County history suggests a population of about 150 to 200 people. The entry appears under lands of Miles Crispin. Now, Miles was the King's Keeper of the Castle of Wallingford and held the honour of Wallingford. Chalgrove was his chief seat. In 1084, he married Matilda Dwayne, who inherited the Dwayne estates from her mother daughter of Wigod of Wallingford and wife of Robert Dwayne, Lord of Wallingford. In 1083, Miles Crispin had founded the Prebend of Wallingford, 
which was a structure to financially support the King's Chapel of St Nicholas at the castle. We know, therefore, that there was a Saxon church in Chalgrove, and it was probably on this very site. An inquest of around 100 years later records the prebend of the Royal Chapel of St Nicholas at Wallingford Castle as consisting of the churches of Stoke Bassett, Stoke, which is now North Stoke, Chalgrove, with the chapels of Ipston and Newnham Murren, and All Saints Church, Wallingford. In 1087, Miles and Matilda gave the tithes of Chalgrove to the Abbey of Beck in Normandy. Between 1086 and 1100, they attached Berwick, Gangsdown, and part of Rycote, later uh, 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 Northwestern, to the manor, thus making the manor an economic, self-sufficient unit. Either his widow or the daughter of the same married Brian Fitzcount, who during the anarchy remained loyal to the Empress Matilda, escorting her to Normandy in 1148. Their sons, as lepers, could not inherit, so the property passed to a relative, William Botterell, and then in 1154 to his brother Peter Botterell, Lord of Ponchier in Brittany. The inheritance included the responsibilities for the castle and the honour of Wallingford, the prebend of Wallingford, the Dwayne estate, and the lordship of the manor and patronage of the Church of Chalgrove. Chalgrove was Peter's chief seat. The anarchy that had started in 1139 ended at Christmas 1153, but much damage had been done. There were reports of slaughter, fire and rapine, cries of anguish and horror on every side. They took and plundered everything they came upon, set fire to houses and churches, and what was more cruel and inhuman to behold, fired the crops which had been reaped and stoked all over the field and consumed or destroyed everything edible they found. As an important supplier of food to Wallingford Castle, Chalgrove would have been a prime target. It certainly seems that the church had been destroyed. The 2014 conservation plan suggests that this church was first established during the 12th century, the earliest part being the nave. It seems therefore that Peter Botterell was responsible for its construction, although it could have been King Henry II himself. When Peter returned to Brittany in 1165, Henry II held the manor and its appurtenances in hand. The constable of uh, Wallingford Castle had a fixed share of its proceeds and the use of the manor house, while other royal servants were rewarded with the, with the benefits of Peter's other holdings. The manor house also may have had to be replaced following the devastation of the anarchy, possibly phase one of Harding's field manor house excavated between 1976 and 1978. When Richard II acceded to the throne in 1189, he granted the honour of Wallingford to his brother John. The castle remained in the king's hands. Prince John, Count of Morten, granted the manor of Chalgrove with all its attachments to Hugh de Maloney, by which grant Maloney became a knight of the honour of Wallingford. King Richard later confirmed the grant. Hugh had made Chalmers his chief seat. In addition to the Church of the South Isle, in the additions to the Church of the South Isle created as a chapel, the North Isle doorway and the lower section of the tower and its external doorway, all dating from circa 1190, can probably be attributed to Hugh de Maloney with the support and interest of the patron Prince John. John, both as prince and as king, took a close interest in the manor and managed it when Hugh was abroad. Hugh continued to hold Chalgrove during the minority of Henry III, though the patronage was in dispute. 
When he came of age, King Henry confirmed the grant by Richard I of the manor of Childgrove to Hugh de Maloney and the inheritance of Hugh's son, Peter. Following Peter's death, King Henry took the manor in hand, using it to reward a series of royal servants. In circa 1225, he regranted the Church of Childrow as a prebend to the honour of Wallingford. On Christmas Day 1233, Henry granted the manor of Childrow to Drew Barrington and John de Plessy in equal shares. Drew's share included the capital Messoir's manor house and grounds. And both these young men, whose fathers were knights of the king's household, had probably been among the older companions of the king during his minority, occasionally spending time at Wallingford Castle. John de Plessy continued a lifelong supportive relationship with the king, accompanying him much of the time. He held a number of administrative, diplomatic and military appointments and by marriage became Earl of Warwick. Drew, as a highly trusted friend, became castle holder, administrator and diplomat to both Henry III and his brother Richard. His diplomatic role involved many meetings with the Pope. The close roles record a series of royal gifts delivered to Childrow to the two men between the 1230s and 1260s. Most notably, four timber oaks between them to make posts and wall blades, 47 to John, suggesting major building works on the Duplessis site, and 15 to Drew, suggesting an extension such as phase two of the Hardings Field excavations. Further building works were being undertaken at the church. The north aisle, though narrower than at present, was added, and the upper section of the tower was either added or modified to include the louvered wide tracery windows, sound windows for the bells. The works are of a very high quality, most likely to have been commissioned by the Lords of the Manors, and no doubt supported by Henry and his brother, Richard, Earl of Cornwall, who held the honour of Wallingford. Sir Drew's heir, Sir William Barrington, inherited Drew's extensive estates. And by 1291, William's son, Drew II, had inherited some of these, including Childrove. He made Childrove his chief seat, modernising and extending the manor house for almost continuous living. The, the later, the latter mainly after 1316, when he was no longer Warden of the Isles. Edward II had acceded to the throne in 1307, immediately bestowing Sir Piers Gaveston with the Earldom of Cornwall. On the 31st of January, 1310, Gaveston appointed Bonacursus de Frescobaldis, a Florentine master builder regularly used by the crown as rector. The Frescobaldis family were well-known builders and painters throughout Europe. If the exceptional architecture of the chancel and its exquisite wall paintings were the work of the Frescobaldis family, the contract would have been complicated by Gaveston's murder in June 1312 and the loss of his treasure. Further complications may have been added by the King's appointment of Nicholas de Litchfield as rector on the 18th of December 1312, while Bonacursum still held the office. And we await the results of more recent research with, with eagerness. Of similar date to the chancel, the south door of the nave probably replaced the one of circa 1190, which may have been reused at the Barrington Manor House. One of Gaveston's executors was the royal judge, Sir William de Bereford, who married Margaret, the de Plessy heiress, <coughs> lord of the de Plessy Manor. And it may have been either both lords of the divided manor who provided financial assistance to ensure the completion of all these works. Chancel became the mausoleum of the local Barrington family for the next five generations. On the 17th of June 1317, Edward II made a grant to Tame Abbey. To the Abbey and Covenant, a convent of Tame, of the Advowson of the Church of Chalgrave, 
for the sustenance of six monks beyond their number to celebrate divine services daily in the abbey for the souls of the king's ancestors and of Peter de Gaveston, Earl of Cornwall, also licensed to appropriate the church. Chalgo's close connections with the crown and Wallingford Castle ceased. So there we are, I hope you enjoyed that and, and, uh, and, and some of the slides, fascinating. Um, we're going to spend um, 10 minutes now, it's called Riddle Room in the, uh, uh, so, so, uh, in the, um, in, in the programme, so if anyone wants to wriggle for 10 minutes then welcome. Um, uh, coffee, uh, bathrooms obviously, so, so 10 minutes or so and then we will come back um, to, uh, to, to listen to some of them.